Welcome to the Lightning Talks. We're going to get started here in just a couple seconds, or a couple minutes, I should say, with a talk about LFX mentorship. Letting people come and filter in, get their seats. Welcome, everybody. I'm Duffy Cooley. I'll be helping moderate the lightning talks this evening. I'm glad you're all here. We're going to have some pretty cool talks. These are five-minute talks to share perspective about um, what people have experienced in the, in the space. And just kind of, it's pretty wide open. You can talk about anything you want. So it should be really a lot of fun. I'm going to introduce our first talker, or our first speaker. Welcome. Uh, yep. OK. Yeah, OK. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. Yeah, my name is Namgyu Park. I'm a member of Litmus Chaos, which is incubating sense project, and also a junior at Konguk University in South Korea. Yeah, uh, open source contribution is really meaningful to the developer. Uh, you can grow up your technical skills and also a communication skills. But when I first tried to contribute to open source project, uh, yeah, it seemed really it seemed too tough to me because I don't know where to start. As you can see, there are so many directories in one open source, and like this person, I lose the way to start journey. And also, there are too many choices to select one open source. Uh, as you can see, there are so many projects. There are more than 150 projects in CNCF. Yeah, that's hell. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if you are in a similar, similar situation as mine, I highly recommend LFX Mentorship. This program is online mentorship program for three months, and the main goal of this program is transfer knowledge from the mentor to the mentee. And mentors are primarily maintainer of the CNCF or Linux Foundation open source project, so you can contribute to open source projects while being guided by your mentor. Yeah, I participated in LFX Mentorship in 2023, quarter one, and contributed to Litmus Chaos, which is open source ca chaos engineering platform. Yeah, when you first join this program, you, you will be assigned a task. In my case, my task was improve code quality and add unit tests of Litmus Chaos components. During this program, we had a weekly sync of meetings every Wednesday uh, in this in these meetings, we set weekly goals, leaving peers, and share ideas. And if you, uh, you may face an issue, uh, don't worry. Just discuss with your maintainers and communities with various channels like GitHub and Slack. They may help you. So after this program, I've done a lot of things. Like I raised over 10 pull requests, and they are all sort of successfully merged. As well as technical contributions, I also wrote a blog post to, blog to the uh, Litmus engineering teams or, and CNCF blogs. And finally, I became a member and I continue to contribute to open source. Yeah, so if you are not familiar with the open source contribution process, how about join LFX mentorship or open source community? Yeah, especially thanks to my mentors and thank you. Thank you very much. Ben, come on up. There might be a USB C one too. This person here knows for sure. All right. He's got to go back there to turn it on. I see the power button.
All right, welcome, Ben. Okay, so uh, I already lost a few seconds. So this is going to be a very strange talk for me. So bear with me. Um, this is something I, I haven't done before. I was talking about tech things, and this is not about something technical. So there, I've used a lot of mid-journey things. So sorry for that. And the general idea here is going to be in this talk that if you have problems concentrating, if you have ADHD or ADD or something like that, playing chess. Uh, is can help you with that. So, just a few, really few words about what is ADHD. Is there, sorry, is there anyone who doesn't know what is ADHD today? Like, it's hard to concentrate, impulsiveness, uh, uh, hard to get organized. So, this is something that it, with is all our world with, we have around uh, today in the DevOps world, in the IT world. It is really our daily lives. So uh, why is this important to talk about? Because I can show you that over the time, from year to year, more and more kids are, uh, are diagnosed with ADHD. And uh, uh, I think that these kids are most of the times are growing up as to adults who are also have problems with ADHD. This is my family. Uh, I can guess you can see who, uh, who am I on the, on the picture. But I have uh, four awesome kids uh, out of the four three have ADHD, and the fourth wants to be diagnosed with ADHD, but he's not, because he says it's a cool thing in the, in the family. Uh, and you can guess which one of those doesn't have ADHD. i leave you with that. So I myself uh, used to be for a long time uh, a, work, um, a security person, someone who were working on building attacks, reverse engineering, and stuff like that. I was really, I think I was really good in that. I was hyper concentrating on things. I could work for a really, really long time on, on, in, the, in this stuff. And when I moved into being an entrepreneur, it, the whole world changed around me. I have to uh, give attention to so many things today that it is sometimes hard to keep up. Now, uh, one of the things I used to do is I used to play chess, chess with my father, and uh, my father was a chess champion. Uh, I didn't become a chess champion, but I think after two or three years, I was able to play sometimes draws with him, which was really cool uh, when he made mistakes. But when I grew up, I, I stopped playing. And when my kids uh, uh, were diagnosed with ADHD. We were look, uh, reading a lot. I didn't like the idea of medicating, uh, medication for kids. I tried to go for alternative treatments. End of the story, they got also uh, uh, medical um, uh, drug treatments. Uh, but beyond that, we are also uh, looking, for, looking for multiple things to help to improve uh, their concentration. One of them was this uh, uh, idea of uh, using chess actually to improve uh, the abilities to concentrate um, in this chest uh, in this study, which I'm sure I'm bringing here, and there were a few others, but I just brought this. They said that there has 44 kids uh, uh, in their study who, for 11 weeks, uh, uh, played uh, two hours of chess uh, uh, all the all these weeks, and at the end, 89% of them reported improvement. Uh, this is like really boiling down this, uh, uh, this study, but in general, there has been shown by multiple studies that there is a, con a way to improve with board games uh, uh, the abilities for concentration for uh, kids. So ever since I am myself, in the last past years, uh, returned to play chess, I'm playing chess uh, in a very specific way through chess.com and with my kids. Uh, these are two different things. One is for myself, the second is for them. And what seems to be working is actually uh, um, for me that I'm playing long games, uh, uh, like even for weeks, but every day I invest like uh, uh, an hour or half hour calculating uh, uh, my moves. And, um, and I think that the, my kids started to learn how to organize them, themselves a little bit to concentrate a little better. And what isn't working is, for, especially for the kids, is sometimes the learning curve is hard, and they don't f feel that they don't succeed, then it's not a good you know, idea to push. In general, it's not a good idea to push the kids for something they don't like. Uh, and sometimes they, they get very impulsive when they are doing some 
stupid moves. But in general, uh, uh, this is what I wanted to present, and my chess clock here, chess clock application is just <laughs> pushed. So thank you very much. All right, let's get switched up. Hi, I'm Li Han from the Intuit. So today I'm in this lighting talk, I'm going to talk about how we are using the existing open source tools to support the GPU workloads on our Kubernetes platform. So as you can see, the GPU-based instance, they are usually they are much more cost have much more cost than a general purpose instance. Usually it costs at least 5x. So, but if you look at the below graph, the GPU utilization for a typical model inference workload is very low. Whenever you have a traffic, the GPU utilization bumps up. Then during the off-peak time, there is almost there is no traffic at all. So, but unfortunately, you couldn't, for one port, you could only grab one GPU. You couldn't grab a fraction of the GPU. So that's why we think maybe we need to share the GPU across multiple parts. There are very sim unfortunately the open source tools the, from NVIDIA, they already support this behavior. So you can see that the first very simple way is time slicing, which is supported by almost all the NVIDIA GPU architecture. So let's say in the step one, we create a node with a GPU instance. Inside that GPU instance, it comes with four GPU. So you can see here, in the node capacity, it shows four GPU available. Then for your pod, you only, in the pod resources definition, you only need to set, hey, in the limits, I need one GPU. That's all. You need to grab a GPU for your pod. Then how, to, how do we share multiple, how do we share the GPU, one single GPU across multiple pods? So for the NVIDIA Kubernetes device plugin, you can, in their config map, it, you can just set, in the time slicing configuration, you can just say, for one GPU hardware, actual hardware GPU, I want it to be exposed as eight replicas, like eight virtual GPUs. In this case, you can see after you restart the plugin, it is a daemon set in, running on your node, then you will see, that, oh, now they have 32 GPUs available. Now you can schedule 32 pods on your GPU, on your single instance. Previously, it is only four. But this way, the time slicing way, it is very simple, but the drawback is if you, there is no hardware isolation at all, if you have very noisy neighbor, then if it consumes a lot of GPU, then the other parts, they might crash or they have get affected. So there is another more secure way, which is uh, multi-instance GPU partition. With this feature, this is only supported by some advanced GPUs like NVIDIA A100. And it, it supports some, by default, it supports some predefined partition method. For example, with one 800 GPU, it have eight memory cores. You can support it into, into you can split it into, into two partitions. Each one has four memory cores. Then this will be four GPU hardware for you. And alternatively, you can split it into three, three GPU hardware, each has two memory cores, or it have seven, GPU hardware each has one memory core. All these are available, and to enable this, you just need still using the, the Kubernetes device plugin developed by NVIDIA, you can, in the MIG configs, you can say, okay, I want seven, I want to split this GPU to seven virtual GPUs, each one with one memory core. That's all you need to do. After you do this and reload the plug in, you will see that now your nodes actually expose seven GPUs. They are net, in their GPU hardware level, they are already split for you, and you have more secure hardware. So in this case, if your service have a very strong SLIA requirement, then what I recommend, what we recommend is using this kind of MIG strategy. But of course, this one, it is, it will split a lot of, it will it will still cause a lot of friction, and you will still waste a few GPUs. So the simplest way, I will skip this slide, this is just a conclusion, but for this one, for time slicing, it is very good for a bursty traffic. So after we talk about the 
this share, GPU sharing, we have very basic upscaling based on HPA. So basically what you will do is you, you add another add-on which will expose the GPU utilization metrics and for your deployment, you can naturally use the HPA can just naturally scale up, scale down based on your GPU utilization. Another one we are doing right now is we are using KEDA to support some external metrics. For example, if for your machine learning pipeline, you have some another extra queue that is waiting for consumption, you can use a queue length or you can use the, uh, the average processing time for that queue to do the, ex to do this external metrics to do the HPA, HPA scale up and scale down. I think that's all my talks about. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. I love all of these perspectives. There's so many, thing, so many great things to talk about. Austin, come on up. Thank you. Got a timer for me? Oh, timing me, great. I did have slides and then I realized that the slides were functionally useless, so I decided not to use them. Hi everyone, my name is Austin Parker. I am a director of open source at Honeycomb, a member of the Open Telemetry Governance Committee and all around roustabout. Um, who's heard of Open Telemetry? Dang, that's great. Uh, I want you all to transport yourself back in time to 2019 around this time. Who'd heard of Open Telemetry then? Many less of you. So I was putting together slides for a talk tomorrow at Observability Day, and I found the blog post we published back in, I want to say May of 2019, that was like, oh, here's, the, here's how we're going to merge open tracing and open census together. And it had this extremely hopeful timeline that involved um, announcing the official launch of OpenTelemetry at KubeCon in San Diego. <clears throat> so, you know, we kind of missed that by a little bit, but I am proud to say that OpenTelemetry, as of now, has accomplished its original goals. Um, we set out to do tracing metrics logging in major languages, API, SDK, whole nine yards, a tooling ecosystem. The growth of this project has been nothing uh, less than phenomenal. And just looking at you all and your answer to my question, proves that, right? You went from a handful of, you know, observability nerds back there to like half this, more than half this room, three quarters of this room. So, great, thank you. I appreciate you so much for that. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about what's next because it's been really cool to see us hit those milestones and achieve what we set out to do. But, you know, the, the, the pace of progress always is moving forward, right? So there's two big things that we're looking to do in open telemetry over the next year or two. And the first is profiling. Who's used uh, PProf or any kind of profiling tool? Cool, so you know what profiles are, right? At a high level, it is a dump from the runtime that shows exactly what is happening and being recording these sort of things overall over the course of time, and then kind of picking one and saying like, ah, I want that one and getting this really like line level, code level um, idea of what's happening. Right now, OpenTelemetry does not support this. However, we have a working group that is uh, assembled and is making proposals on how to support this inside the OpenTelemetry at a protocol level, at an API level, and at an SDK level. So that's one thing. The second thing is we're going from the very bottom of the stack to the very top. Who's used um, a phone recently? Cool. I, I appreciate the people that didn't raise their hands because I aspire to your life. <laughs> if you've used a phone, a website, if you have used Uber, if you use literally anything, then it is almost certain that you have been um, profiled as part of real user monitoring or RUM. RUM is a very difficult thing to actually do because while conceptually it looks very similar to APM tracing and sort of the basic building blocks of the open telemetry data model, it is not, because when you're using an app, you're making a lot of different requests, and you need to stitch all those requests together into some sort of session, right, or some sort of longer term thing that kind of roams with you. There's a lot of things that can interrupt those sessions, right? I can change cell phone towers, I can lose connectivity, I can uh, have my app randomly update. 
Open Telemetry is going to be tackling this problem and coming up with a first class definition for sessions, users, clients, things like that, and to support a true real user monitoring experience through the protocol, um, through the API, through the SDK sometime over the next year or two. Again, we have a working group on this. People are here talking about it. If either of those things sound super interesting to you and you would like to learn more or get involved, um, please come find us at the Project Pavilion at KubeCon. Uh, please check out the Open Telemetry Observatory on the show floor. It's one of the activation zones. Um, talk to some hotel maintainers. There was a couple here earlier that gave great talks and we would love to have you involved in the project. So thank you for your time and I will cede it to the next person. Thank you, Austin. <coughs> all right, Tiffany, come on up. You're next. I'm loving, all, I'm loving all of these awesome perspectives. I mean, it's everything from ADHD to observability to all kinds of great stuff. Really looking forward to, to some more of our talks. How many of you have been to Rejects before? Nice, we got some newcomers. I like it. All right. <laughs> and here's Tiffany. Okay. Sweet. I can figure this out, I guess. I'm not used to having to hold this. All right, um, so yeah, hi again, if you came to my talk this morning. <laughs> so yeah, uh, naming is hard, Kubernetes edition. Um, if you didn't see my talk, I'm Tiffany Jernigan. I am a developer advocate at VMware. Uh, Twitter slash X or whatever is there and everything else plus that is on the link tree. Anyway, okay, so exhibit A, so services. Basically, um, we can't uh, start or stop them in Kubernetes. So if we take a look at some other tools that have services, um, for instance, if you take a look at system D, uh, since it's a process, you have the ability to go and start and stop it. If we take a look at, say, Docker Compose, you have the ability to go have a service and go up and down with that. If we take a look at Docker Swarm, in case you haven't already forgotten about Docker Swarm. <laughs> um, basically, you can decide, hey, I'm going to decide whether it should automatically start. And then we have Kubernetes, where a service is defined as a method for exposing a network application that is running as one or more pods in your cluster. So can we start and stop that? No? OK, this is a little strange. Um, so what is something that we can maybe name it? Well, before, actually, if you take a look at that QR code, a long, long time ago in Kubernetes, they were actually called portals. Maybe this works? I don't know. Um, all right, so another thing for services, you don't actually need a load balancer service to do load balancing, though we have specific types of load balancer service. So if I go and like have a, pretend this is like a chat GPT conversation, but with Kubernetes or something like that. So basically, do I need a load balancer service to be able to do load balancing? Well, no. Uh, basically, by default, if you're using, say, cluster IP or node port, it actually does load balancing among the pods that you have there anyway. OK, so then, well, if we're doing load balancing anyway, why do we also need a load balancer service? Well. Typically, if you're dealing with things like running in some sort of cloud-based uh, with a, some sort of provider, um, which a lot of people do, and maybe initially that was the reason behind it, there, the load balance service actually creates some sort of external load balancer that you have associated. So for instance, in this kind of complicated diagram that I stole from Jerome's uh, training, which if you want to see a lot more information on all this stuff, uh, you can go to that QR code. But basically, for instance, with this, you have like ELB, NLB, et cetera, just a bunch of different external types of load balancers. But there's exceptions as well to this. So basically, if you're doing something like running with bare metal, then you can't create your just typical external load balancer. Things don't exactly work as you expect them to. And that's where there's things like Meta LB or Cube VIP, and they deal with things with like virtual IPs, and you have to actually provide uh, IP addresses since they can't just create everything out of nowhere. So it's kind of confusing on both sides of things. So maybe some potentially less confusing naming instead of load balancer or not <laughs> is like maybe you could have something like whether it's 
for your cluster. It's public facing or private versus public or internal versus external. So then another one is, so back more services. Uh, so external names, that isn't actually necessarily external. Uh, so basically, like you could have, for example, uh, using kubectl, you could create a service with, I'm just going to call it hello, and then you give it your service name dot namespace dot service dot cluster dot local. But you can't actually access that from outside of your cluster. Um, this is a pretty common uh, way that people end up using external name, though. So maybe you could instead call it like DNS alias, for instance. Um, another one is the API version is not just the version of the API. Actually, it is the version, so v1 for instance, and then it is also the API group. I literally have no idea what to actually call this besides this, and honestly, I, my job is not like, uh, I don't know, it's dev developer advocate, naming advocate or something. My naming is probably worse anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess like I'm not saying that we should go and change everything. Things obviously have changed already. For instance, like portals are no longer called portals. And the purpose of this talk is to not like go and say bad things about what already exists. It's just there's a lot. Things can be complicated. You may already know what services are in some of their tools, but that's not necessarily the same here. So just like things to keep in mind with the different inconsistencies and naming and just help others who are new to figuring out Kubernetes or even if. You are, have been doing it for a while yourself. So, yeah. Uh, thanks. Question. Oh, no. <laughs> thank, 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 thank you, Tiffany. So, wait, if you file that PR, can we all upvote that? So we <laughs> I like it. The emoji vote. Come on up, James. Welcome, welcome. So as a follow-up question to how many of you have been to Rejects before, how many of you would come back? I love it. Hope you're getting something out of it. It's a great, it's a great ease into the craziness that is KubeCon. And now, welcome James. And of course, we've got it on a different screen. One moment All right, thanks, Dahi. <laughs> hey, team. Uh, let's have a chat about what is next for uh, etcd. Um, is that going to work? Maybe, possibly. There we go. Uh, I'm James. Uh, I'm Red Hatter. I'm an etcd project member. I'm a reviewer and a, a co-chair for the new SIG etcd. Uh, I also might be winning the jet lag Olympics after flying in from New Zealand uh, yes, uh, just the other day, uh, 15 hours, um, hence the kiwi and the kiwi referring to our uh, national animal, which is this weird flightless bird. Uh, kind of ironic given the flight I just took. Uh, but anyway, uh, what is etcd very quickly? It is the distributed reliable key value store that's used by Kubernetes to persist cluster state. Uh, but I'll thank uh, Josh Berkus for this wonderful um, thousand words in one picture. Uh, cool, continuing on. Uh, so in my sleep deprived stupor uh, the other night while I was throwing together these slides, um, I came across this GIF and I decided it was the perfect metaphor uh, for etcd on a good day. So you, you've got the, uh, the tumbleweed coming across here as new like key value entries coming into the store. Uh, and you've got the crickets chirping, sort of representing the raft you know, protocol, replicating that out, right? Uh, and then you've got the whole sort of imagery of the desert and, and uh, the, the sort of feeling that on a good day, etcd is, is, is kind of invisible. We don't think about it, it's just doing its thing. Uh, keeping our awesome, highly available clusters alive. Um, but if you are really, 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 really unlucky, uh, maybe one day your three-node etcd cluster might decide to do something like this. Uh, this is called a data inconsistency, and the example I've got here is uh, maybe you got some Redis deployment, and uh, you do a kubectl get pods Redis, and you do it a couple times, and the first time's, yeah, awesome, here's your pod. Uh, third time lucky, yeah, what pod? Uh, maybe you're getting nodes, and it's like, oh, yeah, nodes ready. Mm, hang on. No, nodes not ready. And you get all sorts of weird and wonderful behavior going on. So from the project perspective, we take this stuff really seriously. Um, but we can only really dig into this stuff if the project is healthy and we've got some, you know, some contributors and maintainers that are working on problems related to that. 
And that's where I want to really call out um, free, kind of rewind to March 2022. This is an Etcity project maintainer. You won't be able to read this, but it's a maintainer reaching out with an open letter to the Kubernetes steering committee, uh, basically saying that the project was kind of down to two people uh, and it was looking really dire, Tim. Um, but thankfully, uh, things have moved on from this point. And if we look now, uh, a lot of good stuff has happened. So uh, we've now got a new membership model in place for the project. We've got a bunch of new members that have joined in. Uh, we've got a new maintainer that has returned. Um, we've got a couple of folks that are now reviewers, myself included. And we've got a, now a Kubernetes special interest group for etcd to make etcd a first class citizen within the Kubernetes project, given that criticality for etcd moving forward, uh, for Kubernetes moving forward. So, um, things are looking up. This is the uh, total contributions for etcd sub projects by month, and it's going in an awesome direction. Um, if we look at our PR time to engagement, we've gone from a pretty scary five days uh, for first engagement um, to uh, lower than five hours now, which is, is pretty awesome. Uh, so, yeah, what's next for etcd? Well, I, I don't have time to get, dig into the technical stuff, but there's some awesome talks coming up at KubeCon. Uh, in the coming few days to dig into that. I just want to talk about the human side of things. And one of the things we've got coming up on Tuesday is a contrib fest. So uh, if the thought of contributing to like a 10-year-old project like etcd sounds terrifying, uh, you're not alone. And, and that's something called uh, imposter syndrome, and it's real. And uh, let's acknowledge that. And I just want to be really, really clear, uh, thank you, uh, that you will, uh, you, you're invited, you're welcomed, your contributions will be valued. Uh, we would love to have you join the team and get involved, uh, and you can make a difference. Uh, so we'd love to see you there. I uh, hope everyone has a wonderful KubeCon uh, next week. That's my talk, thanks very much. Thank you very much. I love that Etsy started as a, uh, as a project in CoreOS, and it was an intern project. Wild. <clears throat> so welcome, Giovanni. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. So this is going to be a little bit different. Um, this is sort of part of a bigger talk that we're doing at DOK Day tomorrow. So I'm sort of just starting mid, you know, in the middle of it. I'm Shivani. I work for a company called Elotal. We basically work on multi-cluster Kubernetes tools, and one of the things we are building is a multi-cluster control plane. So we call it Nova, and we have enhanced it to support DR automation. So disaster recovery is a critical business, critical problem, and uh, being able to automate the failover is helpful in many uh, business scenarios. So all I'm going to show you today is just the demo part. I'm not going to sort of go into the magic of how this is accomplished, because you don't have time. What I'm going to show you is Nova deployed on a <coughs> Kubernetes cluster. And there are three other clusters which are registered with it as workload clusters. Each of them is in a different region. Uh, on two of them, I'm going to deploy a Percona database, uh, Postgres database using the Percona operator. And the third one is going to have a HA proxy. Uh, we have a Postgres SQL client, which is going to talk to this uh, DR uh, orchestrated database using the HA proxy. They are replicating data through the S3 bucket. And Nova control plane is the one that's going to do some magic when the failure happens to switch the standby to be the primary, as well as reconfigure the HA proxy to go to the new primary, which was previously the standby. So a lot of times, all this has to be done manually. People can't find run books. You know, there's human error. All sorts of stuff happens. And you know, the RTO is creeping up. Users are seeing the outage. So by doing something like this, in an automated way using um, orchestration eliminates all that and you know you can guarantee better SLAs to your users. So let's get into the demo which my colleague Jan recorded. He did all the hard work of setting this up. 
So first we are going to, so this is running on the Kubit, um, NOVA control plane. It's going to show you the workload clusters that NOVA is managing. You are going to see three clusters. We are going to go ahead and deploy the Postgres database on one and two. And NOVA has something called policies. So the deployment of workloads happens using policies. What you see here is the operator, the uh, Postgres operator manifest. And it has a label called pcluster all. So this is basically indicating to a scheduled policy, which I will show you shortly, that distribute this operator on all the clusters which are going to host the Postgres database. So that way you have the operator everywhere, and it has the same configuration. There's no drift. So as you see, this policy, which actually we missed, uh, it zipped by, but it basically said duplicate. That was the key magic. So what is going to happen now when we deploy this operator YAML, it's going to get duplicated on uh, both cluster one and cluster two, and it's going to be exactly the same. Now we're going to do the same thing with the S3 secret, uh, which will uh, get deployed on both clusters as well, and this will ensure that the secret is the same, and you know they can uh, read and write without uh, uh, being out of sync. Let me just go ahead a little bit. Right. So this is the S3 secret. Again, it's going to use the same spread policy with duplication and end up uh, exactly same on both clusters. So there you go. The secret is being deployed. Now let's jump ahead to where we actually deploy the clusters. So I'm deploying the first cluster. This is uh, using the secret, but this is not in standby mode. Then I'm going to deploy the second cluster. Let me just jump ahead, uh, the second uh, Postgres database. As you saw, we, that said standby. So this one is in standby mode. The first one wasn't in standby mode. Um, so let me jump ahead. We're going to simulate a failure. We deploy the HA proxy the same way. So let's simulate. OK, so this is the PostgreSQL client. It's basically doing an insert, and then it's going to count from that same table. So you can see the client is getting going here. We're going to simulate a failure of that cluster by um, just you know, uh, destroying the cluster itself. But that simulates a region failure, which may occur in a real life scenario. So what you'll see is a minor blip in the client. But because of our recovery job, which is running in the background to automatically repair it and promote the standby to primary, as well as redirect the HA proxy, this client will come up automatically. You, you will not have a customer visible outage other than you know, a few, uh, few seconds. So this is the few seconds of outage. But as you can see here, the client is already back up. It's already inserting. It's already uh, doing its thing. So yeah, that was it. Thank you. Excellent work. A, a demo in a lightning talk. That's, that, is a, that is a good amount of work. Thank you, Shivani. Jay, come on up. Is that a USB drive? Sorry, is that a CD drive in a laptop? Yeah, sorry. Wow. It's old. Do you want to use the HDMI or do you want to use the regular USB? -C? Okay. Yeah, just pull that off. I'll take that. That looks a little more promising. Oh. Almost there. I think it's on the other screen. So you have multiple desktops. No, that, that won't change anything. What you have to do is either like go to your video settings and mirror the screens. So that probably work. And away you go. Here's your microphone. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, so I, I'm a 
Linux administrator turned Kubernetes uh, ops. So I come from a different point of view. Uh, 20 years ago when I started Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Linux, I thought, okay, I'm going to retire with, with um, Linux. But then, like eight years ago when uh, Kubernetes was introduced, my first um, uh, emotion was panic and fear. <laughs> because I'm going to lose my job. Kubernetes can do 100 Linux administrators' job, right? Like you, you can scale to like thousands of nodes, and then uh, based on that experience, then I thought, okay, l let me like you know learn this new stuff because anyway it's going to eat my job. So l then I started working, and for the past five years, I'm mainly focused on uh, Kubernetes. And then I go to many places where I have to speak with uh, not only technical people, also people like managers and directors and AVPs. For them, this is the only slide I, I show them to convince them you have to move to Kubernetes. I tell them, look, 40 years ago, old VPs and, and all those people know there was mainframe, then there was Unix, and then Linux Windows physical machine, then you had on-premises virtualization, then came cloud, then came Docker. Now, if you want to scale and have IT infrastructure and uh, forget about your upgrading, patching, and wait till Sunday, 12 AM, whatever we, the Linux operations people were doing, forget or any of those things. Do you want your application data center to work like um, Gmail, like YouTube for Google search? Then you have to go Kubernetes now. And obviously, you there is always a low-hanging fruit. Like people have tens of millions of dollars of worth of data centers and application on-premises of public cloud. I tell them. Kubernetes will run on any of your developer's laptop, on your data center, and on public cloud. It, you can run anywhere, and uh, and it can scale from the smallest level, deployment zero, to Google scale if you want. So this is one slide. I found it hugely successful when I speak to non-technical people to tell them, you have to start your Kubernetes journey now. Whatever maturity you have, whatever your company, uh, data center, whatever the size, on-prem, public, or even if you're a startup, I tell them, start with Kubernetes. Uh, this one slide, I, I found it very helpful to convince people. And uh, obviously, some people even ask me, like, what is future? <laughs> I, I also think maybe serverless or VASM, but then that's a different topic. So this is one slide I want to show. And the other thing I want to show is a small animation, which uh, my son actually did using Blender. So what, that is about why Kubernetes, and this is about what is Kubernetes. So Kubernetes mainly you have um, multiple master, and mainly you have uh, the Kube API server and control manager. These are all the component of Kubernetes, and uh, there is no single point of failure. There is everything is true and highly available and scheduler. It will help you to deploy, and etcd is the database for Kubernetes to manage. And um, you will obviously have a load balancer. And then you have tools like kubectl uh, to manage it. And then node is where all your compute happens, and you can scale up as much as you want. And I also speak about persona. Like there will be an operations people who will take care of setting up of Kubernetes and managing it and all. And the second type of persona I speak is a developer. Like because there is always this confusion about who does what and uh, initial introduction. So the developer will start his, his job uh, from an IDE, and then he's, he or she is going to code, and the code will be in a Git repo, and then in a CACD pipeline, it's going to be deployed, and your container is going to be in the registry, and then you're going to deploy. And then obviously, the Technology you're going to deploy could be any of these programming languages, and you just need to containerize your application, and then you have to deploy it. And then an application uh, URL will be provided, and which will be shown um, for the testing team, and then this is the user. And then from the user's point of view, the whole Kubernetes cluster can scale, Google scale, or test environment on your premises or public cloud. So this is where I speak about uh, for the people who want to understand um, what is Kubernetes. Uh, like what is Kubernetes and then there are roles, like the operations people set up your Kubernetes and then you have the developers who is going to build and deploy and manage it and then the testers and, and the users are outside. So this, I, this animation, I've seen it like, you know, helpful for um, people to understand that because there's Kubernetes being big and people don't have a 
clear picture about what it is. So I, I show them this, these are the components, and there is um, clear bifurcation with the operations and, and the developers and the testers and the users. So th this I have found it, you know, uh, providing some use for uh, explaining to everybody uh, to understand Kubernetes. Thank you. Welcome, Alejandro. Alessandro, I'm sorry. Honest mistake. But, uh, thank you for having me. So this is a talk we're going to do next month, me and Marino over there. I didn't think of a better title, so if you have a better title, please come, come forward and tell us. Um, I'm a CSF ambassador, I'm from, I'm Italian, but I live in Amsterdam. Notable things about me, I organized the Kubernetes Meetup and KCD Amsterdam with my lovely wife and a bunch of other rejects and, uh, and uh, misfits. Um, and I work at solo.io. So this talk is about choices. So you wake up this morning, you choose vegan breakfast or meat, you choose to buy an electric car or uh, to vote that politician doesn't believe in, uh, in uh, climate change, this is choice. And make no mistakes, every choice we make are political choices. When we do a choice, we are making a statement about our beliefs and our values. So this is about our choices together as a collective, as a community. So in 1973, uh, MIT scientists, they put all the data they knew about 40 years ago about the world, and they make a model called World 3. The, the model predicted that in around 2040, we all dead. And that was 40 years ago. We are not far from here. So 40 years in, we are really not that far from the core. So as we increase the number of people, we consume more and more resources, we increase pollution, and then at some point there is a catastrophic decline of everything. So how do we, what do we do about this, right? So is there something we can do? Yes. We are part of a community, the CNCF. There is an internal community that is, is the CNCF Technical Advisors Group for Environmental Sustainability. You can join it right today. You can be part of it. And it's about understanding our, the impact of software, the software we all love and build, the, the open source CNCF project have on the, impact, on, the, on the environment. So you can join it, and I'll tell, tell you all about it. In October, we organized a sustainability week uh, where many meetups around the world organize events. Uh, so we did it in Amsterdam. It was pretty well attended. Some, some people were there. So just a little note, environment comes from the French environ, so going around and ambient. Uh, in Italian, we talk about protezione ambientale, uh, ambient protection. Ambient comes from the Latin. I love words, so I always put some words in there. Um, Ambio, which means going around. So it's all what goes around in this room, the ambient. Now, how, why I talk about this? Because this is this traditional architecture, right? So the sidecar model. It worked very well until now, but is there something better we can do? We can invent the future instead of just predict it. So this is the history of Istio. And a year ago, exactly a year ago, or almost exactly, uh, we launched the ambient mode. What is the ambient mode? It's a way to reduce consumption of resources and, and so reduce the emission of your cluster and your mesh. So you go from one proxy per application per pod to proxy per node. And that's, that will reduce the moving parts and thus reducing the, the resources you need. So it is good for your wallet, sure, because you are running less containers. And of course, it's also good for the planet. This is a rough estimation with my incredible Excel skills. <laughs> so you see, in the sidecar model, the, the slope of the curve is so big that you end up, if you use instead the ambient mode, you just have a little overhead of the proxies per node. And as you scale, you can reduce up to 50% of your, uh, of your uh, impact or your pollution. So as a conclusion, if you know what this is, you know. Uh, so don't accept the defaults. There's, you, can, you can make a choice, and the choice has some effect. So we can go from here, the business as usual model, 
to the sustainable world model is actually another prediction from that model where we stabilize our world, our consumption of resources, and eventually we can live forever to space and, uh, and be happy like, like that, so as a species. So you can join the CNCF tag. Um, it's, uh, you can contribute, of course. Tomorrow morning, we meeting with other uh, technical advisory group. We have, we have um, a room at the Marriott Marquise, and uh, I'll be there, and I'll, you are all welcome to join. There's another initiative of a friend of mine, Andrea, Kube Train. So if you go to, this is a choice you can make. If you go to Kubecon, take a train. Don't fly. You can do it. And uh, we plan to do it for Paris, for sure. And finally, you can join us in Utrecht. We have a party tomorrow, solo.io. I wrote a blog about the upcoming Istio, Istio uh, talks at Kubecon. And you can find us at the booth, of course. And that's about it. Thank you, Alessandro. I, I, I love traveling by train. It's such a beautiful way to see the country. Andrea is coming from uh, San Francisco by train. So. Nice. I, I did not choose to do that. That would be a very long train ride. Are you joining? Are you doing it? No, no is you, it you? You? Oh, you? Oh, yeah, yeah, you go. Yeah, you go. Yeah, you go. Yeah, you go. I saw t-shirts. I mean, you could both get up here. There's room. There's room for two. You know. You know. You don't have to duke it out. Are you ready? Oh, <coughs> welcome. Welcome. Oh, thanks. I have. Uh, yeah, I see. Hello, everybody. My name is Todd, and I didn't realize I was going to give a talk today. But then uh, some people wrote my name on the board, and I thought, why not face the fear of public speaking? <laughs> when we face our fears, it helps us grow. When we step into that which is uncomfortable. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. And I've been, uh, I actually made a profession of public speaking, <laughs> even though it terrifies me and uh, still does. Uh, I thought today I'd share with you a little bit about my favorite anagram. And so the letters are team, T-E-A-M, and team is a really interesting anagram because if you look at those letters, you could also, from T-E-A-M, you could form the word mate which is kind of interesting, team, mate. But mate also has some interesting human implications beyond like being a partner teammate. Mate is also what we do when we come together to reproduce as humans and grow our society. So also in addition to the uh, team and mate, you could also use T-E-A-M to form the word meet. It's kind of interesting, right? We've got team, we've got mate, we've got meat. And then if you think about it a little bit, this is my favorite anagram, if you think about it a little bit more, what's the, the next word you could form with T-E-A-M? Tame, right? And, and so that seems kind of random and weird. And it made me totally crack up when I discovered that. I, I just laughed out loud when that came to me because, you know, anthropologically speaking, there are three core directives to our existence. And if you look at the operating system, which is the human mind, there are three core things which the mind is doing 99% of the time. And those three core things are survive, keep yourself alive, procreate, keep the species alive, and belong. And we do that best in relationship with each other, survive, procreate, and belong. And so if you look at team, belong, we also have mate, procreate, pro propagate the species. And uh, so survive, procreate, belong, belong, survive, procreate. Team, and then we have meat, right? And meat is really about like us coming together as a social species, let's get meat, let's eat, let's live, let's survive. And so I think that's all really interesting. And you might be wondering why I'm sharing that. Because we heard a couple of people talk about the imposter syndrome. And the other day I was walking with my friend and he said, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. And I was just like, man, if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> because he works at one of the top security firms, like looking at threats coming into corporations and into our country 
cybersecurity, and he has his PhD in cybersecurity, and he's like, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing, right? And so what I've done in my career is really step into not knowing what I'm doing. I've stepped into it right here. I don't know what talk I'm going to give. I didn't know what talk I was going to give, right? I've stepped into it as a professor. I studied economics and business and uh, was really good with computers. And so at the turn of the century, when there was a, a, a shortage of computer science people, they said, Todd, you're really good at programming. Why don't you start teaching programming? And so I started teaching programming to undergraduate and graduate students. And, uh, and I've uh, continued to step into not knowing what I'm doing. And it terrifies me at times. But somehow or another, my teachings have reached uh, individuals in every country on this earth. And my online courses have reached 450,000 students around the world. And my YouTube channel has reached 3.2 million software engineers, helping them learn the Go programming language. And my former student, Arjun, who I had the pleasure of getting to know, took one of my classes. And Carol, who's from Peru, came up to me and said, hey, I took your class. Thank you for helping me learn. And the reason I want to tell you about teams and learning and the imposter syndrome is because there's this amazing thing called the ripple effect. And you might think you don't know what you're doing, but if you get a camera, and you, you go onto YouTube and you say, I don't know what I'm doing, but here's what I do know. We have multiple intelligences. I'm going to share with you the thing I know, and hopefully this will benefit you. You could change somebody's life. And there's somebody out there right now who needs the information you have, whether it's a word of encouragement or something about Kubernetes or something about introduction to programming, you can change somebody's life. And that's the most re rewarding paycheck of all. Hi, hey, everyone. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, this is Karthik here. So I want to share my uh, startup journey with CNCF. So this is my first coupon experience. And when I came, uh, friends told that there is something called as RejectCon. And I cannot wait but to join here. So when we started the company four years before, we are from uh, ERP world. That's fancy way of reading from SAP. So and we know nothing about uh, Kubernetes or deployment, orchestrations, containers, anything. So we started with our. Uh, Monolith, which later became microservices. And then uh, at a certain point, uh, thanks to uh, Ramesh, who is an ambassador in CNCF, he introduced us to these technologies. And we are a three-person team. Along with me, there are two other persons. Just the, that's the core product team that we have. So uh, what we did, uh, we allocated one person dedicatedly to check technologies in CNCF and to identify which fits our bill. And luckily, uh, uh, we also got a credit from Azure to try out uh, things on Azure. So we tried Kubernetes. We tried, uh, 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 we tried Backstage. Uh, so now, uh, after uh, three, three point four years now, we have all the three people are certified. We are CKAD and CKA now. And uh, we run a multi-cluster multi setup, multi-cloud multi-cluster setup. We run on DigitalOcean, Azure, AWS, and uh, GKE. And uh, we manage our own cluster. There is no uh, third party managing it. And uh, so, so, so if I talk about the journey with CNCF, uh, we, we don't have to uh, get into a costly effort in learning all these things. It's basically three years of effort. Thanks to COVID, it helped a lot in studying and things like that. But uh, the amount of documentation, the amount of materials out there in YouTube, in, 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 CNCF, in, in CNCF sites, are incredible that anybody with uh, with a proper intern can learn and create a startup like what we did. So just wanted to share the story of what we have done and uh, with the with the rejects community. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Karthik. <coughs> excellent, excellent. That was that was definitely a very meta talk. I, I mean, I, I liked both of those talks. Those were great. Welcome, Nele. And then we have a surprise talk at the end of this. We have one more. 
And then I would love to have you all kind of join me in thanking all of the amazing organizers as soon as those two talks are over. I have a plan for that. Here you are. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks for joining. And uh, the topic here is actually a blaming culture is not your fault. And uh, just a reminder, what is the blaming culture if someone is doing an error or a mistake, uh, pointing with a finger to someone and saying, hey, you did something wrong. And I think we are all in the engineering space and in the infrastructure space. So I think most of us had this oops moment. And uh, we, put, uh, we probably all agree if then people start blaming each other, that's not really helpful. And that's also not helpful for learning. So who am I to talk about that? I'm Nela. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Fiberplane. I joined the observability journey in January. So we build tools to help SREs and uh, infrastructure people to debug infrastructure together. And um, that is one of our, uh, the things we do. It's notebooks. Um, so you can bring in your data sources here. It's great. I'm not here to talk about that. We also have an open source framework that's even more exciting. Um, it builds on top of Prometheus and uh, open telemetry. You can find me and talk more uh, with me about that for sure. I love to talk about that, actually. But actually, I was here to talk about the blaming culture. And I think we as a tool builders can build as many tools as we want. If we have a blaming culture, it's not helpful because once an incident occurs, people are not willing to speak up and then tools won't help you. And an organization, basically, that has a problem focuses more on the who is responsible than on the how can we fix the incident quickly. And um, most companies do agree, and SRE teams do agree, we are not blaming, we are not a blaming culture, but why, are, why I'm still talking about that? I think it's not that easy. I think you cannot only say we don't blame each other anymore, we don't point the fingers. I think there is more to it. And the first thing that is there is actually our own past and our own experience that we had in the past that basically form our today's thinking. And if you think about errors and mistakes, most of us, we went to school. And in school, you all get grades. And in my school, it worked that way that I had to write a test to get a grade. And it was a very simple rule. The more errors and the more mistakes I do, the worse the grade gets. And there was not really a process in school um, where I learned that the correction and my learnings from these mistakes will be rewarded. And it was always this point where I had to write the test and mistakes were the thing that was not really good. And then, the yeah, that's the first thing actually that it's an, also the own awareness and the own unlearning of how we think and how we were taught an error and a mistake is. Then the second thing is, that is also not so easy, is the whole organization. So it's not only your team or the engineering department. You are more or less part of a bigger organization, and that organization has a culture. And how is that organization actually dealing with promotions and things like that? So is there a way to reward people who who talk about mistakes? And then there is the obvious one, that you also have leaders, and leaders need to lead by example, so how is the culture about managers sharing failures and, uh, and in general things they did wrong in the whole organization. And then lastly, I think, if we want to talk about, um, yeah, about a blaming culture, lastly, we can talk about those tools that enable a good collaboration once you need to fix something. And basically, those tools should bring different teams together, let different teams have the same access to the, diff uh, to the data sources and, to, and, and enable basically tra uh, transparency when fixing an error or an incident in, in the infrastructure. And yeah, uh, with that, I'd like to sum up those three points I think that I think are important. It's not only saying that we are not a blameless culture, it's also being aware of your own thinking about mistakes. It's the organization and it's a like, it's not only your team, but it's, like, across the organization. And then, lastly, of course, there are good tools out there that help you. But if you don't have the two first things in place, the tools are kind of useless. And I think if you consider all three of them, hopefully, then we can arrive to the point where failure is no one's fault, but an opportunity to learn and grow. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. And our last talk of the evening, and of cloud, uh, of cloud native rejects. <clears throat> Have you all had a wonderful day so far? Yes. Yeah. How many of you here only on Sunday? How many here both days? Oh, that's excellent. That's great. All right. 13 years is my first time. I don't know how to do the 
one that I have my notes in. I guess you are seeing it there. Uh, <laughs> well, I will do it like this because it's a bit easier with me, so I can uh, see my notes as well. And the presentation is about juggling work and parenting. My name is Meg, I have five kids, and I'm bark into working environment. And it's a struggle. It's a struggle. You want to be happy as an employee, and you want to be happy as a parent. So... There are things that make you happy. One is spending time with your family, but also making money. The same is for happy parent, spending time with your family and making money. <laughs> so, what are the challenges? The work-life conflict where you don't know how to spread your hours, which means you need to take leaves for your children, but also you need to finish your project. The inconvenient time, because sometimes uh, the children finish school earlier and uh, the project has a deadline, or you have to travel. Exhaustion, of course. The changing work schedule. The career opportunities you might be afraid you're missing or you might actually be missing because of the stereotyping that exists as working parent. Maybe you don't perform so well. Maybe you need to focus more. And then there is unsupportive social benefits, like where your kids are going to go to school, and the missing village. We are all known as individuals with two parents now. We don't have the support of uh, the grandparents, aunts, cousins, as we used to. And what can we do to improve? We can reduce the commune time. How? By finding daycare that is closer. Ideally, have a daycare at work. I used to work for a company uh, about 10 years ago where we did have, a, for very small kids, a daycare on the first floor, and it was from the company. I know not many do it, but it is our right to ask and create these conditions. Work part-time and hybrid uh, as much as you can. Focus a lot on asking help. Take good care of yourself. Define your goals at work, but also define your goals as a parent. Sometimes you have to let things go and always focus on how to be respectful and also how to have authenticity. Be kind to yourself when you're going to make mistakes, both as parent and at work. And build your mental resiliency and the coping skills. How to create more quality at work? Use your documentation. Don't be the failure point of your team or, or your company. That will give you more space to be a better parent because you will be able to leave more time or you know that when you have to jump out of a project for a couple of days, it's not going to fail. Adapting agile methodology, train your colleagues and learn leadership skills. When you spend your time, make sure quality is the number one what you are looking. Strengthen your parental leave policy at your company Travel with your kids, take them to the events. For example, in Cubicon, there was an option that you would have a daycare with just a simple application. Take your kids with you. And delegate the chores at home. Now, recipe for success, consistency. What works, keep it. Growth mindset, always keep learning. Share and help others. Mix and match. The skills and the knowledge from others, from other fields, even if it's from work, bring it home, and if it's from home, bring it to work. And practice takes time, so be patient. Happiness is important. It gives us hope, positive attitude, it secures our attachment relationship, and it's healthier. These are my references. Thank you very much for your time. I think, 
I think if I had not presented a talk in that much time, I would not have nailed a five minute time mark. I have to tell you that. That's, I, yeah. Did great. Thank you so much. All right. I would like to ask all of you to just kind of wander up here toward the front of the stage for a second so I can kind of get this thing on the screen. All of you, get up out of your chairs, stretch your legs, come on over here. I want to get a huge crowd. You're going to connect it to the screen somehow? Yeah. Yeah. You're doing some magic. Wow. What? Can you do that? So oh. many pictures. Oh, he's got, he's got a USB-C iPhone 15. All right. Come on, as far as you can, push those chairs out of the way. They roll super easy. Get as close as you can. Yeah, can we turn these lights on? Is that possible? Can you play with those light switches and turn some lights on? <laughs> to do what? Oh, that would be amazing. No, I'm going to go. I'm going for the video camera. All right. On the count of three, I want us all to look at the camera and thank our amazing organizers and each other for being here at Cloud Native Rejects 2023. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Woo! Thank you all so much. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being you. Thank you for bringing yourself here. And thank you for being part of this magical event. I look forward to seeing you at the next one.